Welcome back, everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of the Unfiltered Podcast. Uh, as always, I'm your host, Matthew Francis, and somehow I'm still joined by the only person that can tolerate me more than an hour, Mr. Alex Pierce. How's it going, Alex? It is going fa 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 fantastic. No, I'm just kidding. I got a sore throat, so this is going to be a, a real interesting podcast. Yep, he's got corona. It's the Rona, man. <laughs> Real. Uh, so, I want to first. Welcome everybody. Yeah, I want to first uh, start this podcast off by thanking everyone who has listened, shown support, or anything like that for the podcast. Um, the The past couple weeks and the past couple episodes have seen a overwhelming amount of support um, from views to to likes and stuff like that. So it's been amazing to see that, and you know as always if you have any uh ideas topics or anything you can reach out to us on twitter and instagram or um at our email which we'll we'll tell you about later at the end of the podcast um but you can reach out on you know to any of us uh, on any of those platforms and either just chat up a mess or a conversation with us about anything random that's maybe something we talked about in the past couple weeks or something we're going to talk about today or or whatnot but we're always happy to uh, talk with you guys, so reach out to us and, uh, and like I said, Twitter, Instagram, the email, anything like that. Now, listeners, Matthew talks about how overwhelming the support is and how much you guys like the podcast. Now, I don't know any of this because Matthew never feels obligated to tell me. So I that don't is know. not true. You just don't ask. <laughs> Well, it's kind of implied that you should tell your co-host, hey, people like this, so that way I don't I feel like... I told you. One time! Uh, anyways, I'm going to... Alex is fuming over there, so I'm going to let him kick off today's uh, today's episode. And Alex, what do you got for us? So, <clears throat> we're getting into the video game side of things. Watch the trailer for Call of Duty Cold War. The new Call of Duty coming out. Um, off the top of my head, I'm not sure when it's coming out. Um, I actually don't think they released a date on it. Yeah, I don't think so either. Um, Matt, you can take a look at that while I'm talking. Um, I'm very excited for this. The trailer um, showed a former KGB spy, a defector, in which he had a real interview um, back, I believe, in the 70s or 80s, talking about how the KGB had fused itself in society and was trying to, into our society, back then was trying to um, manipulate our economy and our politics. So I have a feeling the way they're going to take this is they're going to go deep within it. I believe it's going to be more, deeper than Black Ops and a lot more intense. Well, it kinda, very... I think it has to be deeper than Black Ops just for the fact that it's building on the Black Ops name. I think it just if it doesn't, it's just going to cause issues for them. And the developer is Treyarch, who did develop um, Black Ops and Black Ops 2. So, and Treyarch has a history of going very deep into the storylines of their games that they've assisted on or developed on or whatever. And since they're the lead developer now, as Infinity War was the lead developer on Modern Warfare, which was very good, but Treyarch is probably my favorite out of them, um, though Infinity War is very close second. I'm. I have high expectations for this. I really believe that they could blow the entire Call of Duty genre out of the water with this game. And if they don't, they're not living up to expectation. Yeah, and like I said uh, last week when we kind of briefly, briefly touched on this, um, and if you haven't, you can go back and uh, listen to that podcast um, in episode two. But when I, like I said last week, I'm not. I, I never got huge into the. Um, Call of Duty side of things. I like I said, I played World War Two and it came out great game. It's awesome, um, and I dabbled in a few of the very original ones. But I think, like I said, with what they put out in World War Two and what the Black Ops series is known for, this has to. It just based off all that, it has to be a great game, and I think it will. <laughs> I think it will be, and I think the Call of Duty franchise itself is going to say, listen, you got some pretty big shoes to fill after uh, World War II and 
what modern you put Warfare. out with the yeah, and Modern Warfare, and even the former Black Ops games, you've got a big shoes to fill, so you better get there. And Vietnam is a Vietnam still, you know, thirty, forty years later. Oh yeah, um, still an extremely touchy subject, and it's but it's such a fascinating one when you look at politics of it. And if you haven't checked out um, Ken Burns' documentary on Netflix, and if you like history or if you want to know more about Vietnam, I highly suggest you do because you get to see how deep and how messy and how ugly Vietnam was. I think if Treyarch plays their cards right, they can get into that with the game. And it's very, very intense. I mean, Vietnam, real life, but much less the video game side of things. I mean, Black Ops was intense. So. Yeah. Black Ops was intense. World War II was intense. Um, and I think they are just going to keep growing on that intensity and keep uh, keep spanning what, they, what they've done over the past two, three, even four uh, games previously. Oh, um, moving on to a different video game. Over this past weekend, um, DC had what they call DC Fandom. DC Comics, you know, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, the Justice League. They had what they called DC Fandom, where they revealed all of DC's new merchandise, and they showed the trailer for the new Batman movie, um, Wonder Woman, and the new Justice League movie series coming out. They also revealed um, the latest Batman game coming out. Now, Batman's not in the title. The title of the game is called Gotham Knights. Matthew doesn't know, that, doesn't know this because I kept it from him. But here's the thing. Batman's not in this game. Dark Knight is dead. So it falls to his the Bat family, the rest of the Bat family. Nightwing, who is the original Robin, Dick Grayson. Barbara Gordon, who is Batgirl. And Drake, who is the third Robin. And Jason Todd, who is the second Robin, who became Red Hood after the Joker killed him, to bring Gotham back into order. Batman's gone, and it now relies on these four, who are all very young, fill into the massive, massive shoes of the Dark Knight. So that's a big undertaking for Warner Brothers and, um, and uh, the developer of the game, who I top of my head i can't remember the name but some big shoes to fill what do you think matt well i think even now anything that any any creator or any uh franchise is doing has big shoes to fill i mean look at the past 10 years alone and look at look at uh you know the whole series with any superhero or anything like that there's a lot of big shoes to fill and i think um that like i said over the past 10 years any any game, any series, anything has grown and just become this huge fran- and really they're they're making franchises out of just these series alone instead of you know Warner Brothers being a franchise. It's this series, and they have to keep building on them, and they have to keep making them better, and they got to keep filling the shoes that came before them, plus adding on to get to the top of that list for, you know, everyone else to try to beat them. And I think that if they don't, like I said last week with Call of Duty, it's going to be a massive fail. But with the way they've done things previously, I think it'll be, you know, interesting to see how they fill those shoes. And you take a look, you look at it. Batman is, you know, everyone loves Superman. Everyone loves Thor and Wonder Woman and Iron Man and all them. How many of them have the dark side that Bruce Wayne, Bat, the most famous character, the most famous superhero in the world, the most widely recognized, the most widely revered, and you put a game that is solely based off of his city. Gotham is Batman's city. There's no doubt about it. And you take, you take the Bat, the Dark Knight, you take him out of that, so that's a massive undertaking like he's the main reason that the game that arkham franchise or the lego batman franchise or whatever it is that's batman related he's the main reason you take him out of it that's pretty ambitious but i'm very excited to play it it comes out next year yeah 
it'll be interesting and i think um you know with it coming out next year and even the call of duty game not having a real release date i think there's going to be more trailers more teasers coming um in the future and more emphasis and build up of these uh this really didn't give a whole you know like a whole span of okay this is what it is um and no series creator no franchise nothing like that is going to do that um but once we get closer to that date i think we're going to get some more uh some more teasers some more trailers out of it and maybe a little bit more in depth to what this is going to be i mean and you look at game the way games have gone within um i'm gonna say a turning point was red dead redemption 2 yeah um and, but it started at gta 5 but red dead redemption 2 really took the video game world by storm and i think and it, backing on that i think when rockstar because there was obviously a huge year difference or, or time difference between gta 5 and red dead redemption 2 five years yeah but for rockstar i think when that turning point was really in the center of those two games coming out and the reason i say that is when you you obviously are planning your next game five six years in advance and they knew when when gta 5 came out that hey yeah we're gonna have some hot fixes for stuff we're gonna be adding these dlc packs or whatnot but this is the next game we have to one up ourselves already there's nothing that came between gta 5 and red dead redemption 2 that is in pretty much every household in the world or at least that have a that have access to some sort of gaming console whether it be a pc xbox playstation there's nothing that came out in that time frame between there. And now we're Red Dead Redemption to World War Call of Duty World War Two, which kinda came in that area as well. That's so, right in I mean it was I think within almost a year that those two came out. So there's been nothing major that's really set itself out between Red Dead Redemption two and today. So with Warner Brothers having these you know, they have these huge characters, right? I mean, they got anything that they want, and they're huge hits with anyone you ask. That time frame, nothing has happened in. So if they can drop a good game that's got people that they like and whatnot, and a, a good storyline, I think they're gonna they're gonna take the next Red Dead Redemption two spot. Or even the GTA Five spot of this, you know, these five years of gaming or these ten years of gaming. When you look at the video game lifespan, okay, you look at you know, a lot of these AAA studios like to put out a new game a year, and there's some differences, but there's not a lot. You know, you look at the Madden franchise, who has who had the exclusive rights to the Madden. In some games, yeah, there were big differences, but in most of them, it was just roster updates, maybe uniform updates, minor stuff like that. Yeah, little hot like fixes Duty, or DLC add-ons, stuff like that. Uh, you look at MLB The Show, which I love, which is a PlayStation exclusive. Um, not a lot of changes. Um, some things have been changed. You look at Call of Duty. Yeah, they may do different eras, but it's still same mechanics. You know, same all that. And I, I but, and I, I like when what you brought up there for a minute, and I'm gonna cut you off for a second there's these games that come out with a console exclusive right and it's strictly that's the only thing it'll ever be on and you know they've like we talked about last week with gta 6 um or even the week before with it possibly being a console uh a exclusive release for the first 30 days on playstation i guess sony and rockstar have been in talks etc but it's not going to be permanent. A lot of these that are permanent, like PlayStation release only or a PC release only, and it's a big game that people like, they're not going to spend the five, $600 or even more if you're getting a next-gen console or a PC just to play one game. And I think if people keep doing that, they're going to be losing a lot of money and a lot of backing of huge fans that 
enjoy playing their series of games but might decide you know hey playstations are costing too much i'm just gonna do a really good quality gaming pc for almost the same amount of money as a playstation and games and stuff the <clears throat> part of the reason <clears throat> me part of the reason um at the show is a uh, playstation exclusive is because it's sony who makes the game sony makes that game and just like like with forza there's an Forza is an Xbox exclusive, which I played it with my friends who have Xbox, and it's a lot of fun. It's Microsoft that makes them. So they're the individual companies that make them. And yes, um, I think with, you know, there are a lot of racing games that are like Forza, Need for Speed, um, The Crew, etc. Baseball, there's only one game for that. And before I got a PS4, I tried playing 2K baseball games. Sorry, but they suck. Oh, yeah. So I was so... I was very happy that I got a PS4 so that way I could play baseball because I'm a baseball guy. I played baseball my whole life. I love it. I live it. I breathe it. I'm a baseball person at heart. So that's the advantage to having a PlayStation. And that's, you know, a big pull to get PlayStation. That Because that's the only baseball game on the market. Only like, you know, Yankees, Nationals. All the franchises are in that. That's the only one. So that's a little unfair to like Xbox, but at the same time, business is business. Yeah, I mean, and like you said, in the end of the day, business is business. But I think they would get a lot more backing if they decided to expand out and move a little farther. Yeah. But, um, back to my original point to uh, finish off this topic before we move on to Matthews. So you look at all these gaming franchises who have just put out one year after year after year. and um, Next year, I highly doubt there's going to be a lot of people playing Call of Duty World War II. No one who plays Black Ops 2 anymore. It's like no one who plays Ghost or Infinity War or you know, with the Madden games. I still have Madden 20 because Madden 20, uh, Madden 21 is coming out tomorrow. Might get it, might not. Um, but no one plays Madden 16 anymore. Madden 16 came out in 2015. Um, Call of Duty World War, uh, Call of Duty Ghost came out in 2013. GTA 5 came out in 2013. It still is a massive, massive following and a massive fan base because they just make that game better. They don't go um, automatically into the next game. They're working on making that game better, giving that game a lot of life. And that's what makes Rockstar so unique is that they put so much effort into one game that they keep that going for, for until the next one. <laughs> until it basically dies is what they do. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, they, like, I mean, look at GTA Five. That's a 2013 game, and they added stuff like two weeks ago that was brand new, new vehicles, new stuff. So they are keeping that afloat, and it's good Still quality stuff too. It's not like, oh, we're just gonna throw this in just to keep it alive and keep the heartbeat going. No, they're adding stuff that people want to buy. Yeah. And cool new little intricacies or, you know, like the Diamond Casino heist that came out last year. Came out last summer. That was a whole brand new ball game. Like, it wasn't Damn. just a new heist. It was, now you can go to a casino and play cards or, you know, yeah. go do this or buy a new penthouse. And that's six years after the original release. That's a big, big thing and to put in so far after the game was originally released. And this year, they, you know, like a, just a couple weeks ago when they released that, they added in the uh, yacht heist. So there's six or seven, I think it's six, um, new heists that you can do if you own a yacht. So that gives the yacht more of a reason other than to, you know, have a sanctuary area where you can blow people out of the sky and stuff like that and, you know, defend. But now it gives a reason for someone to buy a multi-million dollar yacht in the game and save up that money and, and do that for those reasons. And entices them to buy shark cards. Get more money. So Exactly. It's all right, I think that's a good It's all a profit game and that's what they keep doing. Sure. And Matthew, it is your turn. The floor is yours, my friend. Well, I'm gonna move on to more of a realer topic. Um that we have seen kind of growing since, I mean, we see it every year. Um, 
I've kind of followed it a little bit more this year and tracked it down a little bit more just because it's been more prominent with everything since the start of the year. Now, in this beginning of the year, we uh, we heard about Australian having all of these wildfires. Well, I think that brought some light to the United States as well because often people tend to overlook what happens anywhere in the United States, but mainly in the West, um, you know, your Colorado, your Nevada, and your California area, because that's really where it happens the most, even Washington State. But I want to talk uh, just about the severity of wildfires for a little while and um, kind of move in with Alex to his next topic as well with that. Um, but I want to start with some, some facts that I looked up and kind of was shocked by. Um, right now, in the United States alone, this is not the rest of the world, this is not anywhere else. Just in the United States alone, there's over 2,500 active wildfires. That's a lot. And like I said earlier, the majority of them are in the western part of the uh, country in California, Colorado, Nevada, etc. Um, but those fires are growing. And the current number of large fires, um, and large fires are over 1,000 acres, is 93. That's a lot. And overnight, there is seven new fast-growing fires. And for those of you who don't know, fast-growing fires are 50 acres or more that is going up in flames an hour. Alex, do you know how big 50 acres is? Uh-huh. Yeah. It's 37 football fields of fire that is growing in one hour. There's seven of those that started overnight. And there is currently 1,800,000 plus acres that is burning and this has kind of been a major topic now in it's been a major topic this kind of goes into alex's next topic here but it's been a major topic with the political parties over the past couple years um with you know trump wanting to clean up forest floors which actually does help but there's pros and cons with that and I want to get Alex's opinion first on what he thinks, um, but I want to d drop one more fact, and that's since August, the start of the year to August 3rd, there's been over 32,000 wildfires, and there's more than 2.2 million acres burnt. And I'm just going to let that set for a minute while we get Alex's um, thoughts on this and, and what he thinks um, about this whole topic. So, Alex, you want to take it away? No. Nope. Growing up, my dad was in the fire department. So I grew up, you know, oh my gosh, I want to be like my dad. I want to, you know, I used to collect fire trucks and all this fire gear and to watch all these fire department shows. So I've kind of grown up around, you know, understanding fires and understanding situations like this. A lot of people that I've talked to or that I've heard discuss about wildfires are like, well, why can't they just put it out? Well, that's an easier thing said than done. So... Wildfire is very different than a house fire. The house fire, you know, it can combust, and there are different um, aspects. Wildfire, you can take a tree that maybe hasn't had rain in a couple days, or maybe it rained last night. Oh, that's not going to stop the wildfire. A wildfire burns at uh, such a fast and such a fast pace. It has a high combustion rate, as well as can easily be rekindled by anything. Um, it can be rekindled by a single flick of a cigarette or an ash from something or um, a fire that people thought they put out that kept spreading. And they're so contagious and they're so hard to control because they keep moving so fast that it's hard to anticipate, okay, where's it going to go next? Or maybe there's this, maybe there's a big tree that's caught on fire. There's no other trees around it. Maybe it's just a random tree. Well, the wind can take an ash feed that ash and it can travel for a couple maybe a mile or two it can catch something else on fire the wildfires are the hardest thing to predict they're the hardest thing to fix and they're the hardest thing to um control 
because of how fast they burn. And so it's unlike a house fire where you can go in and find the source. In a forest fire, wildfire, there's a thousand of them. There's a thousand hotspots. Fire departments don't have that capacity. They don't have that ability to take a fire truck and go right in and take out this spot, and then they have to go to a next one. So it's just simply um, it is something that's bigger than you know, most fire departments, and it's a world. It's 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 hard to explain better than that, other than it is um, unpredictable at best. I mean, it's a scary thing. And it really is. And I want to back on some of the stuff Alex said. Like a structure fire, after time it runs out of fuel, right? There's there's nothing. If it's not controlled, it's just going to run itself out of fuel. With forest fires and wildfires, like Alex said, a tree can go up. And that tree can burn for hours and hours and hours. Spread ash everywhere. Sp- yeah, spread ash. You get and really the biggest factor on wildfires there, there's two. You got the combustible materials, so whether it be leaves or the trees or, or dry sticks, and then you got the the uh, the current weather, so heavy winds, lack of rain, stuff like that, that you know pushes the front of the fire so fast that we get these fifty acre an hour fires where you know one minute it's an acre, and then in an hour you have more than thirty seven football fields on fire. One fire department can't handle that, and we're currently sitting out of there's there's five levels of national preparedness for wildfires, fifth being the worst, and we are at level five, um, and that was updated on the third um, of August. And with wildfires, they don't run out of fuel. You know, they might hit. There's obviously different techniques and stuff like that where you bulldoze a giant road in the middle and take all the fuel out, take all the dead leaves and branches out and it hits that and stops. And that's great. It'll stop there. You entrap it with a ditch. Yeah. With a or, ditch. or you, you attack it from three sides. You get the, the left flank, right flank, and then the head of the fire, which is the progression of the fire. You get those three sides and you might be able to control it a little, but the wind's still fighting you with smoke and, and embers and stuff. And you might get, an, you might get an anchor controlled, the main acre controlled, but for every acre that is burned, and there's what they call mop up, and mop up is going through, uh, pouring more water on the extinguished fire to put it out and get the embers out, and also raking that fire ground to prevent it from you know sparking again with high heat. For every acre that is burned, there is about four to five hours of mop up that is um, needed. So when you're looking at um, just resources and, and stuff, that's a lot of work. Imagine fighting a fire for four hours and then you got four more hours of mopping up in that one acre. There's just nowhere in the world that can accommodate that unless every firefighter is in one area or mm. it just runs can... completely out of fuel, which unfortunately will never happen until it, Starts at one side of the continent and goes to the other side. If I can interject for a moment. Go ahead. <clears throat> um, two things about that. One about the fuel thing. Fire, a fire is so devastating, not just to the surface, but to the ground, because the fire rots. It can go into the ground. You might not see it, um, and it might not seem obvious, but those embers burn through the dirt. They burn through the dirt. They burn the roots. They scar the ground. It's like a when you get a deep gash on your arm. You're going to have a scar there for a long time, if forever. And that's the same thing with a wildfire because there's so much heat and so much intensity that it burns deep into the ground. That's why in a lot of these places, you see maybe 20, 30 years after a wildfire, maybe 20, 30 years down the road in Australia, it's still going to be a barren wasteland because it burns so deep and there really isn't no any way to stop that. Second thing is, I've talked to again people about it, and they said, "Well, why can't you just go in f- uh, fire and put it out?" Well, house fires are very dangerous and very hot. You know, I've been around them. Um, I've been 
closest I ever got to one when I was in the fire department was about maybe 150 feet. Um, I could still feel the heat pretty good. Like it was really hot. Wildfire is immensely, immensely hotter. And there's no fire protection in the world that can withstand that heat. And so you can't go, you can't even go into the forest. You have to hit it from the air. And even then hitting it from the air and then the, the heat's going to interfere with the chopper and it's going to make the water evaporate a lot quicker. And we, I mean, thankfully we have resources in the world and in the United States where we have large jumbo jets that are, you know, changed out where they can hold water and drop water and, and hundreds of thousands of gallons of water. But it takes time to fill those. It takes resources. And like Alex said, it's going to, you know, that heat is just going to erode you know, imagine standing outside when it's 90 degrees for eight hours. Multiply that by 10, and you're close to what it feels like to be in a wildfire. And, you know... If there's no breeze, it's even worse. Exactly. And when there is a breeze, the fire gets worse because now it's spreading quicker. So it's uh-huh. it, there's not a win situation in wildfires. And it, this kind of goes into your next topic, Alex, with... You know the con- the conventions that just happened, the Democratic convention, etc. Um, Trump is a major supporter for cleaning up the forest floor, getting rid of you know leaves that have fallen off in the fall or or dead branches and stuff like that. And before we get into, it, I want to get your opinion on it as well. My opinion is, yes, it will help in the long run. It'll help because that's what's you know, if you ever try to start a campfire in your backyard and you take a big log and and put it in there and try to light that, it's not going to light. It's going to take way wait. too long. But you put little twigs, leaves, little branches in there or, you know, some plastic or, you know, paper, stuff like that. Stuff that would be found in maybe a trash can at a national park or you know, some leaves off the ground, it's going to light instantly, and then eventually it'll catch that large log that's, you know, in there on fire. So I think, personally, it's a good idea to clean up the the major areas that need it. But before I go into kind of what I would do, I want to hear Alex's opinion on this as well um, and see what his thoughts are. Well, so those of you that uh, don't know, and that's a lot of you. Matthew is um, familiar from the police aspect of things as well as the Republican aspect of things. I'm on the fire aspect and the Democratic aspect. Now, the reason I say that is you can put all that aside because none of that matters when it comes to this. Wildfires, they harm wildlife, they harm human life, they tear down houses, they're just a na- big natural disaster. At the end of the day, Though, you know, our president seems to not believe in climate change, um, which I'm skeptical about, but I know it's, I know it exists. It's existed forever. That's a big factor of it. I mean, you look at a lot of, you know, we produce some of the most carbon gases along with China and Russia and so on and, and so forth. But cleaning the, oh, cleaning the first floor, the ground floor of that is, that's a massive undertaking. There's a lot of, um, that's a lot of money, that's a lot of manpower, but it can be done, and I think it will help. The big thing that needs to be done is there needs to be a stronger enforcement of um, forest monitoring. Like, they need to, okay, look at a certain areas that are highly susceptible because of lack of rain or whatever, and they need to go in there and and water it they need to go in and um that and that's the areas where they need to clean more like areas around where we live in new york um we have a lot of forests we're in the middle of a strong forest area so you don't really have to worry about that plus we have a lot of water and we get a lot of rain areas in like california or the northern half they don't have to worry about that as much because they're you know, they don't have the heat. They don't have the, have a lot of the heat, but not as bad as the southern half. So I think it'll work. I think there's a lot of other things that need to 
happened before. Um, we can definitely say that that's going to help. Well, and here's my the rest of my take on it. Um, looking at what needs to be done, there's millions, like I said, there's over 2 million acres that have been burned already in the United States this year. That's a lot of ground to cover. And like you said, there's other factors, environmental, etc., in it and monitoring. And I think the the Forest Service and other agencies, local, um, local state and federal agencies can do a lot better job you know, amount of that, whether it's the Forest Service, National Park Service, whatever it might be, I think there can be a lot more um, done to look at that. Um, but I think if you look at, well, I'm not going to get into into the topic really today, but if you look at where these are happening, like California, etc., there is a large population of incarcerated individuals there. And a lot of places, especially here in New York, have um, they have different names for them, but they have, you know, in in the prisons, the ability for um, inmates to work, whether it be making license plates or um, with the pandemic that came out, they turned to making hand sanitizer, um, stuff like that that people use every single day. And I think, um, you know, they they do it where you know certain inmates can go out and mow grass at the at the prison or at other state places etc um i'm not saying that you know we're going to turn everyone out there etc because that's just a huge undertaking all in itself <coughs> but you have a large number of incarcerated individuals and if you put some sort of incentive at the end obviously the people that are serving life or 25 years to life they're probably not going to be your people but the ones that have maybe a drug charge or a uh, gun charge something that's three to five or even three to ten years and they know they messed up they've been through the whole system they've been through you know counseling etc and they know they messed up they admitted it if you give them incentive to say hey you help out the the country that you you know kind of not betrayed, but broke the laws in for whatever reason, and you're going to go back out in a year or three years and be an active citizen in, why don't you help us out, clean up, join this task force to help clean up some of the major areas that are high risk determined by new improvements or, or new monitoring in certain areas, like I said earlier, and it'll be a a good works you know work program that might in return reduce your sentence by a little or um you know get you on the good behavior list etc to hopefully get you back out into society and be productive again and get a good job etc and not you know get a drug trafficking charge or a, a felony gun charge etc I I I agree with that. I do believe that that's a very uh, oh, that's a that's that's a good idea. That is a very good idea. I do like that, um, and I think that would help. You know, it's you know sort of that community service type thing that they do with like speeding tickets if you can't pay it or yeah. I mean or, they they do it all the time and on the local level with you know a speeding ticket or maybe you littered. Even littering is a huge one where you you get caught throwing a bag of McDonald's out the window. And next thing you know, you know, some states I, here it's a five hundred dollar fine. Some states it's four hundred dollars, whatever. Where instead of that, they have the option to give you community service, where you have to go pick up trash on the side of the highway for you know this stretch or whatever. And even um, they do the adopt a highway programs where uh, a company or or a business or something like that or an organization will quote unquote adopt the highway and they'll maintain it you know pick up the trash etc every once a month or whatnot um and they do have inmates do that and that is a community service thing and i think out in california with cal united states has the i think one of if not the largest uh incarcerated population in the world and in the united states california is the largest um state that has the 
um, most incarcerated in the United States itself. So I think if they take some of those people and, you know, like I said, give them some sort of incentive, um, obviously not your, your 25 to life or your murderers or anything like that, but your low risk offenders that have maybe gotten on the you know wrong side of the law and realize what they did, realize they messed up, put them out there. Not only does it show that they were, you know, active, helping the community while incarcerated, trying to better them lives. So when they get out, someone might see that and say, hey, you know, I need this person for this job or whatnot, or you're applying for a job that shows up that you helped, you were in the good behavior, you know, you were on this list, etc. What's not, you know, let's hire you. Why not? That's a, that's like I said. That's a good idea. I'm in favor of that. So, and that kind of moves into, you know, with what Trump's been saying. With yeah, we need to clean up the floor, the forest floor, and I think that's good. Obviously, some things, you know, some decay actually help the environment, help the fungus, and, and you know, stuff like that grow and enrich the environment in certain areas. Um, but I think uh, he is a little ambitious on his ideas. But it could be tweaked and worked with and, um, you know, moved on in the future and hopefully prevent some of these 2.2 million acres of going up in flames. Does that move into my topic? Yeah, I think it does. All right. Oh, now to the thing that I know a lot of people either like talking about or absolutely despise talking about. Politics. Last week, we had the Democratic uh, National Convention, which um, the first two nights uh, were boring. Typical, you know, first night they have a uh, famous Democrat speak. Second night, they formally nominate the person. The last two nights is where the things get interesting. Um, now, the tradition for a convention is to bash either the current president running for re-election or the former president who's out of terms that happens in every convention and, and the opposing party does the same what we what i saw last week from the from when kamala when kamala harris spoke I was very interest interested as to what she would say kamala harris has a reputation of being tough um, she was tough as california's attorney general she's tough as a senator she's just She's a tough she's a tough lady. I wouldn't want to cross her. She showed a side of her that night that I think is going to really help her. Cuz she didn't totally bash Trump. She criticized him as you know, as anyone would and as opposing and as I have on many occasions. Um she showed that sort of willingness to work with anybody and then the next night with the vice with vice president biden said the same thing they took a very different approach than most people thought most people thought they'd go in and bash trump and whatever they showed this willingness to bash, bash trump a bit they decided to take the high road well in response the president as he consistently consistently does took the twitter to say um, call Kamala Harris a mean and nasty woman. I get it if you're, you know, attacking another politician's a normal thing. And attacking their policies is basic. That's basic in politics. But when you attack them as a person, as a character, calling her a mean and nasty woman, okay, that's just, that's not called for. That is, you know, that is so... It's out of line on so many ways. And to the, tonight, and as well as up the rest of the week, we have the Republican National Convention. And I have seen nothing, nothing from the Republicans that show that it's going to be as nice or as uplifting as the, the Democratic National Convention was. And I have a feeling it's going to be a complete attack on Biden and Harris. An interesting part that happened last week was a big Republican figure who came in, I think, third or fourth in 2016 for the nomination. Governor John Kasich, Republican governor of Ohio, came out in support of Joe Biden. 
he's a strong influence in the Republican Party. And with him not taking the stage this week, but taking it last week in support of the Democrats, that is a massive shift and an indictment of how even his own party dislikes the president. Matthew, your turn. Well, yield the floor to Matthew Francis. Here's what I th- I think, and I agree with you. I didn't watch the Democratic um, convention. I didn't have time to. I had other things that were going on, so I don't know. You know, I saw some highlights here and there, etc. So I don't really know. I can't touch much on it. Um, but going on to what you said, there is always a bashing of either the current president or the one that's out of terms or even just other politicians in general. And that's gone on since... Basic politics, 101. Yeah, that's gone on since day one in the United States and really any other country before if you that. look at it. Um, yeah, even before that yeah. in England. So there's... I don't really see you know, whether one side was nice or one side's mean or whatnot. Whatever. Uh, that I could care less about, and it's going to happen. Like you said, it's been around since before day one of the United States, and I really don't care. And I think a lot of people really don't care what's being said between one side and the other side. But what I do think is that when you start deforming people's character, that's a different story. And I'm not saying that one side is worse than the other here. I'm saying both sides have done it. And oh, yeah. we've well, seen it, true. you know, with Trump's tweets, yes. But we've also seen it in some of the stuff that, that Biden has said. I haven't seen it so much in Harris just because she's kind of come into the picture within the last week and a half. I mean, last week we were talking about the fact that she got picked. So within the last two weeks, we've kind of really seen her get into the spotlight and I haven't seen a whole lot about her and to be honest that kind of is hurting her right now is the fact that no one's really talking about her Um, and I think that's a direct result of being picked this late in the process Um, but in the end of the day I don't really think the bashing on either side is wrong or right I think it's indifferent and I think a lot of people think that um, I could be wrong, but that's just kind of my opinion, what I see from people, etc. But in the end of the day, the, the defamation of character on both sides, and even people in their own parties, right? You know, we've seen Democrats, you know, bash other Democrats. We've seen Republicans bash other Republicans. And, you know, character deform them and, and you know, such. And that's where it gets hurtful and offensive, etc. And we've seen it on both sides, it's nothing to hide. People have seen it. People have commented on it. News has commented on it. The media has commented on it. So, in the end of the day, the bashing on either side I could really care less about. It's not going to reflect on my vote in the in the election. I don't think it's going to reflect on a lot of people's votes in the election. But how they are, the, the words they're using to do it, that might. See, I follow... I follow under the beliefs that of John F. Kennedy and that era of the Democrats and Republicans where, yeah, attack the policies, attack what they stand for. Okay, that's fine. That's normal politics. Attack their party. You just didn't cross this line of attacking their personal life or attacking um, or bringing up their families. And with Trump, done it so much over the years that even when he was running 16, I wasn't surprised he was doing it. So therefore, when someone else does it to him, I don't really get worked up about it. But when he attacked John McCain, who all accounts was a war hero and a oh, widely respected senator and someone that I I looked up to as a right, he was a he was a Republican. When he attacked John McCain, even after his death, there's this sort of you don't really you shouldn't speak ill of the dead unless they deserve to be spoken ill about like Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin yeah you can speak ill of them all you want they're just horrible people there's this respect to those there's a respect that you have to those who did what they thought was best and did what they thought was right that you should uphold and this president 
Mind you, there are plenty in the Democrats that have done this too. Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, on and so forth. This president who's consistently showed that he has a disregard for the character of a human being, um, it really rubs me the wrong way. And it it's, shouldn't be indicative of the presidency of the United States. I mean, you can say what you want about George W. Bush, say what you want about Barack Obama. At the end of the day, you knew their character was, though they had different opinions on it, they respected human beings for human beings. They didn't go out and attack the person's character. They attacked what they stood for some of the time, but they didn't attack the character. And that's where I lose respect for people like Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, and Donald Trump. They attack the character of the individual. And it's just, it really bothers me in a whole new light. And I, I agree with that. You know, like I said before, and you said I come from a um, Republican side of things, criminal justice side of things, etc. But and I come from the Democratic side yeah. of things. Or... But in the end of the day, we agree on the same thing here, that defamation of character is not good in any any way, shape, or form. It never has been, never will be. Um, and the bashing, like I said, whatever. It's the words that you use. And it goes back to that lovely saying we all learned in kindergarten. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And the end of the gold. day and the end of the day they're words, right? Yes, it's gonna it's gonna suck for people that are on the opposite side of the defamation and character, etc. And it like I said, it's happening on both sides. We can all agree on that. But in the end of the day, they're words. You gotta someone that's true and persistent through things will look past that and say they're just words i'm going to push myself even harder now to do what i'm doing and try to get to where i want to be unfortunately for me at least i don't see that happening on the democratic side nor the republican side in any way shape or form um but i just i think people are getting too caught up in uh you know social media basically civil war between the two sides um and they're not pushing through it and they're not trying to get to where they want to be and uh, in the end of the day i think that's what's going to hurt them is they're not on both sides they're not persistent through it and they're letting words get to them and a big thing about this is matthew's one of my best friends i've known matt matthew and i have known each other for what 12 years something like that yeah at least yeah, at least. And he's a Republican. I'm a Democrat. Who freaking cares? When we get together, it's usually a fun time. We give each other crap all the time. I mean, just the way we are. I have an uncle who is Democrat, who supported Bernie Sanders. I have another uncle who is very much a conservative Republican who still to this day supports Trump. And I love them both. It doesn't matter that you know, I differ from both of them on opinion and I share some opinions with them or I dislike Bernie Sanders a lot and I dislike Donald Trump a lot. I don't care. Family's family. I still love them. Too many people allow this divide of Republican, Democrat, say, oh, you're a Republican and I'm a Democrat. Well, screw you. You're bad. You're evil. Same thing on the other side. I'm a Republican. You're a Democrat. You're bad. You're evil. There is nothing right about that. It is the antithesis. That is the complete opposite of where we should be, especially in the time of COVID, a time where so many things are going wrong. So many things are happening and you're letting politics, the political parties in the way. George Washington said it in his uh, final speech as president in, 18, in 1798, I believe, um, when political parties were first becoming a thing, he warned against it. He said... Uh, can't exactly quote it right now but he basically said that political parties will be the downfall of this nation and and what he's right and i mean in the end of the day no matter what party you're on it's a shit show like it, and you just have respect for human decency yeah and both sides lack that in a lot of ways exactly and in the end of the day political parties do divide this country more than anything in the world and 
you know, there's a lot of things that divide us, but political parties are really that straight down dividing factor between what people think, you know, Democrats might say, oh, we're good and they're evil. Republicans might say, oh, we're good and they're evil. It's that dividing line. And that's really what's, in the end of the day, dividing everything and uh, just causing issues for really, you know, reasons why we can't get through certain things or we have to have these civil wars on social media to um, do whatever and try to backstab the other people. It's, and it really is a, it's, it's appalling because the rest of the world laughs at us. Granted, the rest of the world has their political parties, but <clears throat> the rest of the world laughs at us for that. They look at us and think you know, we're divided on every important issue. That's why we can't get things done. And I say at the end of the day, screw party unity. Do what's best for the American people and do what's best for the country at large. Not your own party. Screw the party. If I do run for elected office, and this might be an indictment on me and may come back to hurt me someday if I do run, at the end of the day, I'm going to say screw the Democrats. If it's not good for America, I'm not going to do it. And I think that's where me and you get along a lot, Alex, with this topic of you know, political parties and just political science in general, where... You know, I support Republicans, you support Democrats, but in the end of the day, if it's not right for everyone, why do it? Because you mo- you're just going to piss off the other side or you're just going to hurt them so much that they're not going to be able to do anything. And we've seen it on since day one in the United States, since that Declaration of Independence was fine. We've seen it. And it's always been dividing one side's always trying to hurt the other the other side's always trying to hurt you know so on and so forth and when one side wants to you know suppress uh the others point of view or you know, in the media and i say this as a democrat so much of the media is um too far leaning left and then there's fox news as well as others like that they're too much leaning right they trash the, each side when the media's sole job is to say the facts tell it how it is they shouldn't really put their opinion in unless it's their own show but it's just it infuriates me to the end of the day and, uh, and it's a whole mess and I'm with you on it and I think a lot of people are with the fact that no need to have a, a social media war no need to bash the other property just get the job done and do what is best for everyone, no matter their race, Better. no matter their gender, no matter their political status, their political Sexuality party, or anything, like or religion, yeah. or anything. It doesn't matter what they, you know, want to do with their life, as long as it's beneficial for everyone, right? Not just the and not just the American people at large, the world at large. I mean, you can't just sit here and say. Oh, you know, if it's good for the American people, then it's good for everybody. Well, that's, that's a big thing is that you need to make sure that the American people are okay and they're pr- prospering. And that's first and foremost. Very close second is how is this going to impact the world at large? Because in this day and age where I could send a text to someone in uh, Yugos- not Yugoslavia, that's gone, uh, Bosnia, and within two seconds they'll reply. We need to look at the world at large. We, you know, John F. Kennedy said the immortal words. All ch- we all inhabit this small earth. I'll cherish our children's future. And above all, they're all mortal. So. Yeah. So. I think that sends us into the next thing. I think it does. And I want to just close off that last one with no matter what side you support, no matter what you think of topics, at the end of the day, everyone's got to come together and do what's right. Not for yourself, but for your neighbor, your friends, and, and the your, world. Our, and our children's futures. Exactly. Because what we do today will affect, on the line. will affect our great-grandchildren. And that's a long ways out. So just keep that in mind when – and I think that – both political Whoever you parties vote. need to, and, and I think both political parties need to realize that themselves before they start pushing their own agendas. 
Yeah, and however you vote, make sure you vote with your gut and your conscience. Not because you think that one person's better than the other. Vote with your gut. If you think Biden's better, vote Biden. If you think Trump is better, which I don't, but that's, you know, to everyone's own point of view, Trump. Oh. And into our, I believe it's our final topic. Is it, it is Matthew? Our final topic for today, yes. So, just announced while we were in the middle of the podcast, um, NFL commissioner, and this is a good segue from the last one, NFL commissioner Roger Goodell um, said he will support kneeling for the national anthem. So, I have two views on this. <clears throat> um, and again, I have my uncles and my family, they all have different views on it, and it's another heated topic. I have two views on this. Kneeling for the national anthem does bring a put a spotlight on you know, injustice, sy- systematic racism, which there is some, um, and stuff like that. Now, according to the Constitution, we have that right. It is supported by the re- it is supported by the Constitution in Article One. It's right there in black and white. So they they should be allowed to do it. I don't think that there's. Um, I agree that it's you know I just I agree that it's not the best thing in the world because I do believe there is. Um, I would never do it personally, though I'm for you know social justice reform and stuff like that. I wouldn't do it personally just out of respect for those who fought and those who died. That's my opinion. But those who do do it for do support them because it is in our constitution that they have that right to do so i just personally wouldn't do it Matthew, and i agree with you on on points in that you know the constitution does state the right to free speech and, and that's what it is is free speech um but i stand with you with the fact that no matter if you're black white hispanic whatever it might be whatever your sexuality is if you are an American citizen, there have been members, your neighbors, your family members, whoever, that have gone overseas and lost their lives and et cetera to make sure you can uphold that, you know, right to free speech and everything else in the world and in our Constitution. Um, and they have lost their lives. They have lost, you know, limbs. They've lost anything imaginable. Um and I think that out of a res- you know respect to them, it's not appropriate to kneel. Um, but like you said, it is in the Constitution. It's right to free speech. And I'm personally not going to get extraordinarily butthurt over it. Do I think from my point of view, it's a little disrespectful to the people, not the country itself, but the people that fought for the country? Yes, I do. And that's my personal opinion. But in the end of the day, I'm not going to get mad at someone that's deciding that yeah, right. Exactly, that's kneeling and supporting their, you know, constitutional right in what they know, believe is right. Them. Exactly. And you know, touching on that, I come from this view of sports and politics. Sports is something that should bring us together, or you know, fan bases against fan bases. Because I'm a diehard Eagles fan. Matthew's a diehard Bills fan. But whenever the Bills and Eagles play. We're not friends that week. We're going back and forth. And then, you know, if the Eagles win, I'm giving him crap for the rest of the week. If the Bills win, he's giving me crap for the rest of the week. And so sports is a place for us to come together and just go back and forth about our teams. Now, Matthew and I have had, um, when we were in high school, we both played on the golf team. It may make us sound like losers, but um, I wouldn't say that to our golf coach, who is the greatest wrestler in NCAA history. People, Not a lot of people know him, but those who do, my cousins who wrestled years before me were jealous that they that they knew out he was my coach. Is Mean Gene Mills, the pinning machine, NCAA's all time uh, record holder for pins, an Olympic wrestler. He should have been an Olympic wrestler, and this is why I believe sports and politics should be totally separate. Um, during that sport, 1980, um, the Soviet Union invaded was Russia. The Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. Protest. Jimmy Carter, who was our president then, decided, oh, we're not going to go to the Olympics in Moscow to boycott that. Therefore, robbed that entire class of Olympians, including our coach, their opportunity where Coach Mills would have won gold. He would have schooled everyone. He, he was schooling everyone prior to that. He would have won. 
robbed our coach of that opportunity, as well as every other member of that Olympic team, get to their life's goal. When it comes to sports, I have no problem with athletes off the field using their platforms for what they believe in. You know, Malcolm Jenkins and Anquan Bolden, two NFL players, did that. LeBron James did that. You know, off the court, off the field, whatever. And you use your platform as a famous you know, celebrity or whatnot to do that? Go right ahead. That's that's your prerogative. Like that's that's in the First Amendment. On the sports field, when you're supposed to bring people together and just have a good time, and for thousands of people to sit at home and watch a game and root for their team, I don't believe that that is the right place to do it. You don't want to, you know, alienate people. You want to bring them together, and that's what sports does. Oh, so fan bases against fan bases. At the end of the day, we all love football or we all love baseball or soccer or basketball or whatever. So I think bringing politics into that sense is, I, I always will disagree with that. And I agree with you on that. Like you said, we have different views on football teams and we don't talk the week that the, the Bills and Eagles play. Um, no. And we certainly yell at each other, whoever wins at the end of that game. But in the end of the day, we're still friends. We still enjoy and it's like the red Sox and the yankees in baseball yeah. <laughs> they hate each other when it comes to when they're playing but in, other than that they all have one common goal and it's like us we we you love the eagles i love the bills but when the patriots play pff, screw well, them. we all so we all just... we all come together in in the end of the day and enjoy it and i think politics affect that a lot and bring a negative light to it and like you said, on independent platforms, whatever. Say what you want to say, be you, and that's what you have your, your constitutional rights for. And, and even on the field where you might be kneeling or not, but that's your constitutional right. Some might find it disrespectful, and that's their opinion. And we all know opinions are like buttholes. Everyone has one, and <laughs> they usually stink. Um, but... In the end of the day, you might have an opinion, I, I have my opinion, and you guys at home listening have your own opinion. And all of our opinions, even though they might be on the same page, they might end up in the same boat, they're all going to be different. And uh, it's not worth arguing about something that everyone has a right to, and it's not worth tearing apart something that everyone loves and and I think that's what's causing issues is a lot of people don't that don't even watch sports are getting involved and have never seen a football game in their life and they're saying oh this guy's kneeling this guy's not and they don't understand what's going on they don't understand that they're just supporting their constitutional right and they're on what they should do yeah and like they tune in see it and then they just tune out and they've never watched a game in their life so my advice would be leave it be it, it's they're supporting the right you might find it disrespectful personally i do find it a little disrespectful but in the end of the day it's not hurting anyone it's not you know if anything it's destroying or building their personal reputation um do i think I that people like the NFL commissioner, the NBA commissioner, whoever sing it on a NFL platform. No, but if you're doing it on your personal one, whatever, go right ahead. Your constitutional right. And I support you in that decision. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> to pretty much cap that off, look at the guy who started it. Colin Kaepernick he says it was for to protest racial injustice. Other people, other players, when they say that, I believe them. You know, Malcolm Jenkins, uh, Eric Reed, um, whatever, you know, so on and so forth. I believe them. But when Colin Kaepernick did it, he was becoming a nobody. No one really wanted him to play. I mean, he wasn't, you know, people say, oh, give Kaepernick a second chance. He doesn't have the talent. He, he I believe, and I, I will stick by this, proven otherwise. Kaepernick did it just to get his name out there for attention. And i that's what I firmly believe. Um, where others did it for actual reasons, I believe he did it just for the attention. 
And that's another thing that politics, unfortunately, get involved with. And they make it a political opinion and try to push that they're just doing it for their own agenda, etc. Yep. But I think uh, unless you get anything else for today, I think that uh, I'm going to conclude today's episode. You got any final comments there, Alex? Um, I always have comments on everything. You know this. Oh, that is true. I am like I am like a uh, self-opening pinata. It's just one thing after another that comes out of my mouth, and it's usually a treat for somebody. Yep, and you usually hit him, and he doesn't stop swinging. Um, yeah, basically. <laughs> but I think that's going to conclude today's episode of the Unfiltered Podcast. Thank you for stopping out and tuning in, and again, thank you for all of the support over the past three weeks. Um, it's definitely been seen and we're going to keep producing these episodes and keep talking about uh, anything and everything because that's, you know, this is the podcast that that happens on. But uh, I've been your host, writer, and executive producer, Matthew Francis. I'm your co-host, writer, and executive producer, Alex Pierce. Please make sure to follow the podcast, leave a review on Apple Music, Spotify, wherever you find your podcasts. You can follow me, Matthew Francis, on Instagram and Twitter at Matt F underscore media 14. And I will link that in the uh, the videos and stuff like that. I know I didn't last week, but I will this week. You can find me on Instagram at Alex Pierce underscore unfiltered and on Twitter at AJ Pierce 243. And for me, that's all, folks. And finally, you can also email us at MatthewFrancisMedia at gmail.com if you have any questions, comments, concerns, or topics you'd like to you know, hear us talk about. So with that being said, we will see you next week, and uh, thank you for stopping out. <laughs>